A hundred years on, the Great War still has enduring resonance. But our understanding of it is often a caricatured mixture of mud and death, poets and poppies. In this series, I want to clamber out of the trenches to explore the deeper meaning of the Great War and its momentous legacies. One paradox of the war is that it wasn't caused by profound political or ideological divisions, but it did create them in its wake. The war made politics red hot. It gave birth to an age of mass democracy with the vote extended to ordinary men and women. Today, we take democracy for granted. Elections are familiar, even boring. But a century ago, democracy hit Europe like a big bang. In the aftermath of war, the old order was blown apart and the people rose up. Three leaders offered three very different visions for harnessing and directing this people power. Three ideologies that would convulse the world. First, Lenin and the Bolsheviks seized control in Russia. They presented their one-party state as the stepping stone to a workers' paradise. A series of copycat revolutions ignited the center of Europe. Second, Woodrow Wilson, the American president, championed liberty and republicanism with no place for monarchs and aristocrats. By 1919, Europe had nine new American-style republics. A third leader, Benito Mussolini in Italy, smashed communism and rejected liberal democracy to pioneer a new militaristic ideology with a cult of the great leader. His model, fascism, would inspire demagogues right across the continent. Communism and fascism were dramatic, dynamic, and seductive. The big ideas in the aftermath of the Great War, and they polarized much of Europe between left and right. But one country peculiarly muddled on, little touched by these great ideological battles. Britain, its unlikely leaders were pipe-smoking parliamentarians forging a series of coalitions and reaching for the centre ground. And while monarchs toppled across Europe, the British royal family was rebranded as a symbol of the nation and apex of the British dominions in the Commonwealth. In fundamental ways, I think, the long shadow of the Great War has shaped the politics of Britain and the world right up to the present day. A century on from 1914, we are still trying to manage the explosive force of democracy. The Great War was a people's war, truly democratic in its impact. It was indiscriminate in its slaughter of officers and conscripts. It also demanded the toil and the sweat of millions of men and women on the home front. Unable to win a quick victory, the warring powers were forced to mobilize their whole economies and societies. This total war imposed a massive strain. The question was, which country would buckle first? Nineteen seventeen was the year when the old world order started to crack. In the Russian capital, Petrograd, the bread supply collapsed triggering a wave of strikes and street protests that toppled the Tsar. 
Soviets, or workers' councils, spread virus-like through factories and the army. By the end of 1917, Lenin and the Bolsheviks had seized power in the name of the workers. Their ideology of class revolution directed by a one-party state posed a radical challenge to the old world order of empires, monarchies and parliaments. Democracy can mean very different things. For us, it's a political idea, freedom of speech and free elections. But for revolutionary Marxists like Lenin, it was more about economics and equality. Seizing private property in the name of the workers and forging a modern industrial state. When Germany and Austria-Hungary collapsed in the autumn of 1918, revolution spread from Russia across the continent. One uprising in the name of democracy, triggering others. You can think of it as a European precursor to the Arab Spring of our own day. A botched but bloody revolt engulfed Berlin, and communist governments were proclaimed in Hungary and Bavaria. In Britain, the masses also seemed to be getting Bolshe. Soldiers mutinied at their camp in Calais and miners, railwaymen and transport workers launched one of the biggest waves of strikes in British history, threatening to bring the country to a standstill. In the corridors of power, there was genuine fear of Bolshevik-style revolution. After pushing his way through a lobby of soldiers in Whitehall, Sir Henry Wilson, chief of the Imperial General Staff, told the cabinet grimly that the men bore a dangerous resemblance to a Soviet. Mainstream politics in Britain were also taking a leap into the unknown by opening up the ballot box. In the shadow of the terrible carnage, the government had granted the masses a say in running the country. In 1918, the vote was given to almost all men over the age of 21 and most women over 30. Then on the 14th of December, little more than a month after the armistice to end the war, Britain went to the polls in its first truly general election. The electorate had almost tripled in size, but how would these unpredictable new voters, male and female, use their new power? Adding to the tension, the election results would not be declared for a full two weeks until after Christmas, so that millions of soldiers' votes could come in from abroad. Amid this fevered atmosphere, another vision of radical politics took Britain by storm. This came not from alien Russia, but from a leader that the British liked to think of as their friend. Come from every quarter, from the north, south, east, and west, to clear the way to freedom for the land we love the best. Good morning, Mr. Zip, 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 with your haircut just as short as mine. On Boxing Day 1918, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, rode into town. Thousands thronged the streets, cheering his carriage. Wilson was an unlikely celebrity. Austere and intellectual, a devout Presbyterian, sure of his own rightness. But he was also a bit of a showman who knew how to play to the gallery. And in London, he dramatically highlighted his distance from the British government. Wilson intended to signal that America had fought for much purer war aims than his allies, the empires of old Europe, to make the world safe for democracy in the egalitarian, republican, American mode. While in London, Wilson was guest of honour at a victory dinner 
hosted by the British King George V here at Buckingham Palace. Hundreds of generals and politicians, princes and ambassadors from across the British Empire were arrayed in all their finery. Wilson cut a very different figure, dressed in an ordinary black suit without medal or braid, and his clipped cold speech made no reference to the contribution of the British Empire in the Allied victory. The gilded audience at Buckingham Palace was chilled, almost as if they had seen the ghost of Oliver Cromwell. A few days later, the election results were finally declared. Having been spooked by the slogans of Lenin and Wilson, the British elite were relieved when the ballot boxes were finally opened. Britain's wartime coalition government was re-elected with a huge majority. Giving the vote to ordinary men and women hadn't triggered revolution after all. Britain had scraped through its immediate post-war crisis. The Big Bang of democracy had been contained. But not every country was so fortunate. In other parts of Europe in 1918, the political turmoil sparked by communism and mass voting produced a radical reaction, a militaristic nationalism centred on the cult of the strong leader, fascism. The testing ground for this new type of ideology was Italy. And the story starts with a desperate battle across this mountain river. Italy had a poisonous Great War. In 1915, it entered the conflict on the side of the Allies, but without broad public support. Divisions were then made worse by the Italian High Command's bungling campaign against Austria-Hungary. Maintaining discipline through savage punishments and random executions of his men, during 1916 and 1917, the Army Chief of Staff, Luigi Cadorna, drove his troops forward mercilessly, one offensive after another, up the steep Alpine mountains rising from the Isonzo River. The futility of these assaults makes the first day of the Somme look like a work of military genius. Eventually, in October 1917, at the 12th Battle of the Isonzo, things completely fell apart for the Italians. Today, the battle is better known as Caporetto, the great humiliation of Italy's war. Bolstered by German stormtroopers, the Austro-Hungarian army launched several surprise counter-offensives. One of them was led by a daring young German commander called Erwin Rommel. In just over two days, Rommel's single platoon advanced over 10 miles, capturing two whole Italian regiments. Rommel had soon realized that Italian morale was brittle. Pressing on resolutely with just a pistol in his hand, he overawed the Italians with his personal courage. They rushed forward, throwing down their rifles and shouting, Eviva Germania, before hoisting an astonished Rommel onto their shoulders. The Italians reeled back to within 30 kilometers of Venice. 300,000 were taken prisoner. Another 350,000 deserted. Caporetto entered the Italian language as a word for shambolic collapse. 
Italy emerged from the war divided and frustrated. To placate the returning troops, in 1918, the government in Rome gave all adult men the vote. Crucially, the voting system was proportional representation, something discussed but rejected in Britain. PR, by encouraging small parties, led to highly fragmented coalitions in Parliament, making Italy ungovernable. Strikes by workers and farmers provoked a sharp backlash from right-wing paramilitary groups. Foremost among these were the black shirts, who called themselves fascists, harking back to the symbol of authority in ancient Rome, the fasces. Their leader was Benito Mussolini, a journalist and Great War veteran, who'd served on the front at the Isonzo River until accidentally injured by a mortar bomb. Mussolini was originally a socialist, but as a soldier, he became a passionate pro-war nationalist, fuming about incompetent leaders and striking workers. For a time, he was even in the pay of British intelligence as a useful anti-Bolshevik, getting the not insignificant sum of 100 pounds a week. But Mussolini did not intend to work for anyone except himself. Mussolini cleverly rebranded his fascist movement as a political party. That allowed him to play the parliamentary game while keeping the thugs up his sleeve. When in 1922, socialists mounted a general strike, Mussolini's fascist bother boys marched on Rome. The government caved in under this pressure and the king appointed Mussolini prime minister. Mussolini then forced through a new election law, giving two thirds of the seats in parliament to the party that won a quarter of the votes, a figure the fascist squads could ensure through intimidation. And so, in Italy, the democratic experiment proved short-lived. Like Lenin, Mussolini believed that liberal democracy was a relic of the past. Parliamentary politics produced only corruption and paralysis. Yet in post-war Britain, Parliamentary governments survived. What's more, a socialist party became part of the political mainstream and a king remained the head of state. Unlike other countries that fought the Great War, Britain managed to hold these incongruous elements together. That, I think, was largely due to two politicians who tend to be written off today. First, Stanley Baldwin, a Worcestershire industrialist, conservative leader for 14 years from 1923 to 1937, and prime minister three times. The country needs well-tried and experienced men at the helm. It is no time for weak government. The nation cannot afford to embark on reckless experiments. Behind the bluff exterior, this was a shrewd politician with a distinctive take on how to cope with the post-war era of mass politics. Baldwin was concerned about how, as he put it, democracy had arrived at a gallop. Giving the vote to the masses was potentially very risky. If democracy was not kept on a tight rein, Britain would be riding for a fall. Woodrow Wilson had talked about making the world safe for democracy. Baldwin's take was very different. We must make democracy safe for the world. 
Baldwin's plan for making democracy safe was to stake out the center ground of politics, quietly redistributing wealth, even if that meant hurting the landed rich, the Tories' natural constituency. In 1919, Inheritance tax rates soared to 40% and then up to 50% after 1930, forcing the sell-off, break-up and even demolition of many grand estates. This is Woolerton Hall, once the baronial seat of the Willoughby family. The Willoughbys served king and country in the Great War. In 1915, Francis Willoughby was killed in Flanders and in 1916, Henry Willoughby died at the Naval Battle of Jutland, while the remaining brother, Michael, was awarded the Military Cross for service in Mesopotamia. But then, after the war, the Willoughbys were stuffed by the government's inheritance tax. By the time Michael Willoughby inherited this house in 1924 as the 11th Baron Middleton, he was forced to sell up. Nottingham Corporation bought the park for the public and used some 300 acres of land to build homes for the people. Today, the old house is home to Nottingham's natural history collection. The author Charles Masterman called the breakup of old estates like Woolerton perhaps the greatest change in the history of the land in England since the Norman Conquest. Just as remarkable as the Tories' adaptation to the era of democracy was the shift of the Labour Party from the radical fringe before the Great War to the centre of British politics after it. This was a story of New Labour, 20s style. Giving workers the vote as a reward for their war efforts began to tilt the balance of British politics. In January 1924, Labour, led by James Ramsay MacDonald, was able to form a minority government, the party's very first taste of power. MacDonald and his cabinet were summoned to the palace. Deputy Leader of the House, John Clines, recalled later, As we were waiting for His Majesty, amid the gold and crimson magnificence of the palace, I could not help marvel the strange turn of fortune's wheel which had brought MacDonald, the starveling clerk, and Clines, the mill hand, to this pinnacle. We were making history. But George V reflected in his diary that Queen Victoria would not have been amused. It is 23 years to the day since dear Grandmama died. I wonder what she would have made of a Labour government. Before meeting his new cabinet here in Buckingham Palace, the King recalled reports of a recent rally at the Albert Hall, where Labour supporters had sung the Marseillaise. His cousin Tsar Nicholas had been gunned down by the Bolsheviks and one Labour MP warned darkly of what happened to Charles I when he opposed a people's government. But the King's fears would prove groundless. Like Baldwin, Ramsay MacDonald was a pragmatist drawn to the centre ground. As Prime Minister in 1924 and again in 1929 to 31, MacDonald's priority was to make socialism respectable. In 1931, MacDonald turned to Wall Street for financial support to stop a massive run on the pound. The conditions the American bankers attached were harsh, including a cut in unemployment benefit, and they split the Labour cabinet. 
An exhausted MacDonald went to the palace and offered to resign. But the king's opinion of MacDonald had come a long way since 1924. George V insisted that he was the only man to lead the country through the crisis, playing on MacDonald's vanity and also his patriotism, a sensitive issue after the nightmare of the war. The royal arm twisting worked. In an extraordinary compromise to weather the financial crisis, MacDonald formed an emergency coalition with the Liberals and Baldwin's Conservatives. The national government, instigated by George V as a short-term crisis measure, went on to run Britain for the rest of the 1930s. While most of the crowned heads of Europe were long gone, the House of Windsor was becoming a keystone of political stability in Britain's new democracy. Something few would have predicted amid the revolutionary fervor of Europe in 1918. In private, George V was not a very attractive person. A martinet to his children and obsessive about court protocol. He was happiest when sticking stamps into his stamp album or shooting defenseless animals. But in his own way, the king was a patriot with a paternalistic feel for his people. The king learned to speak to the nation and the wider Commonwealth via the new medium of radio. Though this was quite an ordeal, his first Christmas broadcast in 1932 was delivered with a thick cloth on the table to muffle the sound of pages rustling in his trembling hand. I can only say to you, my very dear people, that the Queen and I thank you from the depths of our hearts I dedicate myself anew to your service for the years that may still be given to me. So the British monarchy, German in origin, aristocratic to the core and deeply dysfunctional in private, was remarketed for the modern age as the royal family. Harold Lasky, the Labour intellectual, observed with grudging admiration, the monarchy has been sold to the democracy as the symbol of itself. To see how unusual Britain's democracy was, you only need to look at continental Europe. While Britain muddled on with a coalition government under a constitutional monarchy, in Italy, Mussolini was now in his prime as Il Duce, the great militarist leader, overriding people and parliament. In the 1930s at Redipuglia, near the disastrous battlefield of Caporetto, Mussolini built an extraordinary monument containing 100,000 Italian dead of the Great War. It's all very different from London's understated cenotaph. Here is an army of the dead, arrayed rock-like, line after line, when the reality of Caporetto was chaotic rout. It's not so much a war memorial, more a fascist fantasy. Through fascism, Italy's shambolic war could be turned into grand opera and the will of the masses harnessed to a monolithic national party. This was Mussolini's distinctive vision of democracy. Discipline must be accepted. When it is not accepted, it must be imposed. Fascism rejects in democracy the conventional lie of political equality. 
The present century is a century of authority, a century of the right, a fascist century. Fascists like Mussolini were convinced that the masses needed firm leadership from a Superman figure. Although we now think of Mussolini as a kind of theatrical joke, he did inspire others to take an iron grip on the ballot box. Today, Superman is a cartoon character. But in the early 20th century, this idea of a dynamic force taken from the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche gripped people's imaginations at a time when parliamentary politics seemed corrupt and ineffective. The most familiar example is Adolf Hitler. But this yearning for a Superman caught on right across Europe even in advanced, civilized countries like France. Although France, like Britain, emerged victorious in 1918, it soon slipped into the political whirlpool that typified continental Europe. As in Italy and in Britain, the nature of the Constitution really mattered. The Third Republic's Constitution had been designed to block the rise of a Napoleon-style Superman. But this led to a weak government and a strong parliament. The result was political division, a wide variety of parties who formed unstable, short-lived coalitions here in the National Assembly. France had over 40 separate governments between 1918 and 1940, a striking contrast with Britain. And in the 1930s, as the divide between right and left deepened, France seemed close to civil war. The country's socialist and communist left, the biggest in Europe, did not accommodate itself to the establishment like the British Labour Party. And the left was challenged from the right by fascist-style paramilitaries, many of them war veterans who terrorised red districts. In February 1934, fascist leagues massed here in the Place de la Concorde, site of the guillotine during the French Revolution and at the very heart of Paris. Police stopped the protesters getting across the River Seine to the National Assembly, but during a night of rioting, 16 people were killed. Next day, the leftist government resigned. This was an ominous sign of street power. French democracy came under even greater strain in 1936. When a new left-wing government was elected, investors fled the country, forcing a devaluation of the franc. In Paris's eighth arrondissement, a fascist leader in the making brooded unhappily in the wings. Philippe Pétain, hero of the defense of Verdun in 1916, was invited to address the nation on the radio to mark the 20th anniversary of the battle, France's most costly victory of the Great War. Mesdames, Messieurs, c'est au génie français que nous voulons rendre hommage aujourd'hui. Pétain wanted to say, France, having won the war, is on the verge of losing the peace. To his fury, that was censored by the government. But Pétain was still able to make clear his conviction that French politics and society had become rotten. There is a whole program that must be revived. Family, school, army, 
the three guiding steps which make a child into a man. In 1936, Pétain's time had not yet come. But, fractured from within, France was in no position to stand up to the looming threat from the supermen of Italy and Germany. On the continent, extremist politics were driven by charismatic leaders and personality cults. Britain, too, had its fascists. But Oswald Mosley, unlike Mussolini and Hitler, could never turn his fringe operation into a mass political party. By dominating the political centre, the national government squeezed out extremist demagogues like Mosley, and it also pushed Britain's most charismatic conviction politicians out of mainstream politics. The superman whom Stanley Baldwin really feared was Winston Churchill. This was a politician whose formidable will and boundless energy seemed potentially destructive. At times, Churchill's loathing of Bolshevism made him sound positively anti-democratic. Visiting Rome in 1927, Churchill lavished praise on Mussolini. If I had been an Italian, I am sure I would have been wholeheartedly with you from start to finish in your triumphant struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism. In the 1930s, desperate to get back into office, Churchill attacked the national government again and again. On some issues, he was proved right, notably rearmament against Nazi Germany. On others, he seems to us now an impossible reactionary, particularly over India. Baldwin wanted to give India greater self-government, part of his attempt to move the British Empire on into the age of democracy. Churchill was a passionate, die-hard opponent. <laughs> During a break in one of the bitter Commons debates on India, Churchill popped into the jets. Only one space was vacant, and he found himself standing next to Baldwin. There was an embarrassed silence, even more embarrassed than is usual on such gentlemanly occasions. Then Baldwin said, well, I'm glad there's still one platform where we can meet together. But Britain's stability in the 1930s, compared with the chaos on the continent, wasn't just a matter of politics. There were deeper economic forces at work. Now, we tend to stereotype the 1930s as a uniformly bleak era of depression and mass unemployment. But after 1933, there was a surge in new industries producing cars and consumer goods. The good times were felt in the Midlands and particularly the Southeast. And the national government's policy of low interest rates fueled a house-building boom. In contrast to Germany and France's packed, rented tenement blocks where poverty and protest could fester, in Britain, suburban semis spread through the southern half of the country. Democracy in Britain had been established by political compromise and then buttressed by economic recovery. But Britain's peculiar dynamics of democracy threw up victims as well as winners. The trade-off for the nation's heartland doing well was poverty on the periphery. Coal, textiles and shipbuilding were in decline. 
The Great War had stimulated new and cheaper production across the world, right out to India and China. In the old industrial areas of northern England, Scotland and South Wales, the 20s and 30s were an era of almost unrelieved depression. Here, veterans of the Great War and their sons spent years on the dole. The victims took to the streets. So-called national hunger marches on London became a feature of the period. The industrial North and West were Labour's heartland. Their sense of betrayal would fuel the party's politics when it finally got back into power. But that was only after a second brutal war, in which two ideologies spawned by the Great War, fascism and communism, fought their climactic battle. By 1945, Hitler and Mussolini were dead. Fascism and Nazism, things of the past. Now only the heirs of Lenin and Wilson remained. Locking horns in a half century of Cold War, both talked the language of democracy, but in very different tones. The Soviets championed a one-party state and a command economy to promote equality. The Americans offered political freedoms and unregulated capitalism in the name of liberty. Meanwhile, the British, yet again, contrived their own peculiar compromise version of democracy. But this time, in reaction to the political settlement of the 20s and 30s. The new pattern was defined by the Labour government of 1945, led by Clement Attlee, himself a Great War veteran, wounded at Gallipoli in 1915. Labour's case was clearly set out here in its 1945 election manifesto. This argued that after 1918, the people had allowed the hard-faced men who'd done well out of the war to craft the kind of peace that suited themselves. Labour intended to use its massive commons majority to right what it saw as the wrongs of the 20s and 30s. State ownership of the coal mines was the last battle in a long war that stretched back into the Victorian era and the mass strikes after the Great War. And similarly, there was real elation when in July 1948, the Minister of Health, Aniron Bevan, was ceremonially handed the keys of Park Hospital David Hume near Manchester, the first NHS hospital in the country. Bevan watched as a 13-year-old girl became the first patient to benefit from free and comprehensive medical care. Labour proudly claimed that 2,751 hospitals had been brought under state ownership on the same day. It appeared that Britain was making a radical departure from the past. But Behind all the symbolism, Attlee's revolution was a very British form of socialism, mixing public and private. The National Health Service, for instance, nationalised the patients, but allowed doctors to continue their private practice. Only in the 1980s, under Margaret Thatcher, was Labour's social democracy programme seriously questioned. Under Thatcher, some of the state industries were dismantled and privatised, but the underlying balance of public versus private remains a live political issue to this day. Although Churchill is now widely regarded as the greatest Britain, 
because of his war leadership. It's Attlee's peace settlement that still shapes contemporary Britain. And that was itself a reaction to the era of Macdonald and Baldwin, two leaders who helped make Britain a stable democracy at the price of deepening the North-South divide. As dozens of young men pulled on a rope and chains, the chant went up, Mauer Weg, done with the wall. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, communism joined fascism in the dustbin of history. But the other great ideologies spawned by the Great War, Woodrow Wilson's all-American vision of global democracy was given a new lease of life by the George W. Bush administration. When Al-Qaeda attacked America on the 11th of September 2001, Bush's advisers wanted to use American power to enforce liberal democratic values, especially in the Middle East. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, and freedom will be defended. The American invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq were based on the simplistic assumption that toppling a tyrant would produce freedom and democracy. It was rather like the heady hopes across Europe in 1918. The ensuing mess was a painful reminder that Wilsonianism was no more an easy answer at the start of the 21st century than it had been in the aftermath of the Great War. In 2011, a wave of popular uprisings in support of democracy toppled more tyrants in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. The wind of change has come. Egypt, congratulations, congratulations to the whole Arab world. We've done it. The echoes of Europe in 1918 are clear. And now, just as then, real freedom and stability remain elusive. Almost a century on from the European spring of 1918, the challenge is still, as Stanley Baldwin recognised, to make democracy safe for the world.